Hi, everyone. We're going to start very promptly uh, on time because one of our panelists has a hard stop uh, on the hour. Uh, welcome to our event on amplifying the voices of local adapters at COP27 through the Resilience Hub. Uh, we hope for this event to be a very engaging and interactive opportunity for all of you to and for all of us to collectively understand what the regional resilience hubs are in the context of the COP27 Resilience Hub, uh, what has been happening over the past few months as we gear up um, for COP27 and all of the regional resilience hub work that has taken place over the last few months. And for us to all discuss and input into what it is we mean when we say we want to amplify voices of local adapters or frontline communities or lesser heard and underrepresented constituencies. And to get an opportunity to, to hear from colleagues like uh, Marcia Toledo Sotilo, uh, the UN High Level Champions Resilience Lead and Resili uh, Race to Resilience Campaign Manager, to understand in the broader context of COP27 what the adaptation and resilience agenda is, how it's going to be spoken about, and some of the opportunities that we foresee for amplifying the voices of local adapters into a global audience. So without further ado, uh, we want to jump into the session. I'm going to give just a very brief uh, walkthrough of what the Resilience Hub is and what the regional Resilience Hubs are. We're going to walk. Uh, we're going to jump into a uh, facilitated discussion with some of the regional hub representatives, as well as uh, Marcia from uh, the UN High Level Champions team. We're going to then go into breakout groups, uh, region specific for Africa and South Asia, uh, to further unpack some of the key messages, solutions, et cetera, that have emerged out of what has now been over 25 virtual events over the last two weeks, for all of you to get an opportunity to engage and to further contribute to that. And then we'll jump back from the breakout groups into a quick plenary for feedback, do a Mentimeter and we'll close. Of course, this is the first opportunity we've had to have a cross-regional hub dialogue. Um, and once I think I unpack a little bit what the regional hubs are, hopefully uh, this opportunity for you to input. And when you see the red thread that we're trying to draw into COP27, uh, hopefully uh, you'll be excited to engage in this session. We really want you to contribute to what is being said here. Um, so. Without further ado, let's kick off into just a bit of a brief background of uh, the COP27 Resilience Hub, uh, what it is, where it came from, and what will be happening this year, and how the regional hubs fit into it. Um, Emma, could you just please move on to the next slide? Great. So I thought I'd start off with just the Resilience Hub vision. Um, and I think to summarize it in the way I think about it is, this is a space both at and between COPs that is intended to catalyze climate just action and to increase finance to resilience. A dynamic space that will bring together a diverse range of actors uh, from all levels and scales of adaptation and resilience uh, action with a particular engagement of non-state actors. The Resilience Hub is also uh, the home of the Race to Resilience campaign and we'll hear a little bit more about that from Marcia. But I think something that's important in terms of where the premise for this came from, uh, increasing the adaptation and resilience has become a priority in the discussions at COP, uh, but in many ways, those discussions were everywhere, but nowhere, because they were not necessarily consolidated. And I think the resilience hub was a significant step in trying to centralize these discussions and try to take really progressive steps in creating inclusive dialogue around adaptation and resilience. Uh, next slide, please. So I won't go through the broader resilience hub objectives, but more specifically in terms of what the regional hubs are. So last year, regional hubs ran uh, for the inaugural uh, uh, resilience hub at COP26, and regional hubs were an important place for rich contextual discussion at the regional level. This year we're doing regional hubs before so that we have ample time for discussions like the one we're going to have here in the session, um, but also to integrate it more meaningfully into the rest of the Resilience Hub program, as well as all of the various partners and linkages that the Resilience Hub has more broadly. So in summary, 
It's to amplify the respective regional priorities, actions, solutions, and challenges, but also it's an opportunity for those on the front lines of climate impacts in all of their diversity to influence global dialogue and resilience and adaptation at COP27, and over time, incrementally and progressively to strengthen and consolidate the influencing potential of these frontline constituencies over time and to increase their participation at COP. Of course, strong emphasis on being action oriented solutions oriented and a key driver for inclusivity at the, at the resilience hub and more broadly at COP. Um, could you go to the next slide? So I think this is the last one. So without further ado, let's jump into a conversation so we can actually talk to the main proponents that have been driving incredible work over the last few months. So I'd like to invite Marcia, uh, Celine and Shinaz to switch on your videos. Uh, very excited to have all of you here with us, this being one of the first opportunities to have this cross-regional hub discussion and to really start to bring together regionally contextual discussions into a platform like CBA, particularly with the community that attends CBA as practitioners working on the ground and supporting those who do and supporting communities. So before we jump in, let me just walk through and give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves. So Marcia Toledo uh, Sutila, the UN High Level Champions Resilience Lead. Let's start with you for a quick introduction. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody today. My name is Marcia Toledo, and I'm the Resilience Lead of the UNFCCC High Level Climate Champions team. I'm originally from Peru and have a science background, but I've been working in the field of implementation and policy shift for the past 25 years. So very excited to be here today and support bringing your thoughts, your, your priorities also forward towards COP27. Fantastic. Thank you, Marcia. We have Shinaz Musa, CEO of the Climate Development Knowledge Network and a director at South South North, here to represent the Africa Regional Resilience Hub. Shinaz, over to you for a quick introduction. Yes. Um, thank you, Amil. I'm really excited to be here and also excited that there's so many participants that have joined the session. So as the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, we're leading the Africa Resilience Hub and looking forward to take all the very rich messages that are coming out from the various events and from stakeholders uh, to COP at the beginning of November. Thanks, Amil. Thanks, Shanaz. And uh, Celine de Cruz, uh, a visiting researcher at the International Center for Climate Change and Development, here representing the South Asia Regional Resilience Hub. Over to you for a quick introduction. Thank you, Emil. So my own background is in science and social work, and I have been working on with frontline communities, especially in informal settlements with Slum Dwellers International for many, many years. I'm a founder member of Slum Dwellers International. Presently, I work with ICAD, and my job is to bridge the gap between the development lot and the climate people. And while I'm doing that, I'm also learning. So the, the Resilience Hub has been a good space for me to strengthen some of those points that are coming out locally. Thank you. Thanks so much, Celine. We're very happy to have all of you here. And of course, this is meant to be a very conversational space to our attendees. If there are any questions that you have for our panelists today, please drop it into the chat uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get around to it. But of course, there's a 30 minute breakout discussion. And so for Africa and South Asia, there'll be ample time for you to also engage more closely, uh, not just with Celine and Shinaz, but also with the rest of their team and to actually hear uh, more about the key messages. But let's jump straight in. So the COP27 mm -hmm. Resilience Hub is the home of uh, Race to Resilience. For those, uh, Marcia, who are not familiar with the high-level champions and the race to resilience, perhaps you can kick us off with just providing a bit of context and background around, you know, what the high-level champions are, where they come from, and what is the race to resilience? Excellent, definitely. <clears throat> um, the high-level champions were established uh, by the parties of the UNFCCC at COP21 in Paris. You know, the role was to connect um, mostly the action and ambition of the governments with the many voluntary and collaborative actions taken by cities, regions, businesses, investors, local communities, and any other non-party stakeholder. At COP22, the Market Partnership uh, for Global Climate Action was established. 
as the framework for non-state actual engagement to the process. That is how the HLC and the market partnership work hand in hand. Um, the only institution is the only institution with a formal mandate under the UFCCC to connect the climate action of non-state actors with national governments and their climate goals. That's why our intention and our emphasis is to bring those solutions, those ideas, reflect what is happening on the ground in regards of adaptation and resilience, and generate an ambition loop with the state governments. At COP25, the partners agreed the important role of the non-stakeholders and extended the mandate for five years. Ahead of the COP26, um, we launched the Race to Resilience campaign in January 2021 with the goal of putting people at the center of adaptation and resilience impact of 4 billion people by 2030. We had an opportunity to elevate the work of coalitions, associations, cities, regions, businesses, and investors to deliver action that translate on improvement of resilience to people. And in the COP26, we were able to showcase to and provide a report to states on what are those collaborations, what are those ambitions and near-term solutions that can actually generate impact in regards of adaptation and resilience. And this is how this year, ahead of COP27, we're gearing up to bring those opportunities advanced at the Race to Resilience campaign, very much as well part of the bigger narrative and agenda of the Resilience Hub, but connected to the initiatives and opportunities that the COP27 offers in regards of elevating an agenda of action, showcasing implementation, and improving access to finance or other opportunities to, pro to deliver a resilient climate work that is just. Great, thanks so much, Masi. And I think super important, particularly given the context of CBA and the, the tagline of linking local to global, to also get the background on what some of these massive global campaigns are um, and, and hoping to unpack that further in the breakouts as well in terms of what it means to meaningfully bring voices of these lesser heard and underrepresented constituencies into global spaces such as COP and to a global audience. What does it mean? How does it add value to these constituencies? And what is actually taking place in order to try and facilitate this? But let's try and go from the global and back down to the regional hubs. Uh, for many of you joining this call, you may have engaged with the regional hubs thus far. As I mentioned, there's been over 25 virtual events. So I thought, you know, we'd kick off with trying to understand how we got to those virtual events. Of course, the regional hubs were not just there to have events for the sake of having events. It was very much there with a targeted purpose for engaging within the regions and trying to elucidate and understand what these key regional priorities and messages were. We didn't just want messages like we need more finance, uh, of course, what we wanted was more nuanced regional messages, particularly those from constituencies that may not otherwise be heard in these spaces. Um, fantastic. Hi, Paz. I see you've joined us. We do actually have another panelist joining us from the Latin American Caribbean Regional Hub um, and has, uh, was struggling to join us earlier, but fantastic to have you. Before we actually jump in, um, Paz, uh, perhaps over to you for just a very quick introduction and then we'll loop you into the panel discussion and continue. Hi, sorry, sorry to be late. Uh, it's, uh, I, I was struggling to find the link um, with the rough night, sorry about that. Um, well, my name is Paz Gonzalez. I'm from Latin America. I live in Argentina and I'm part of the Latin American Resilience Hub. And so it's a, a pleasure to be here with all of you. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you here, Paz. I know it's very early on your, on your side as well. So we're very, very glad that you were able to join us. Uh, Paz, we're just uh, jumping into the discussion. So you haven't missed too much. Um, so we're just going to start unpacking the regional resilience hubs a little bit more so that everyone can understand quite the diversity in how different organizations leading in different regions sought to understand how to engage in their region and how to bring forward these messages. And I think it's really important to listen to the methodology and the approaches that these different organizations have taken. And of course, we'll get a chance to unpack it in the breakouts as well. So Celine, let's start with you. The South Asia Regional Resilience Hub chose to focus on engaging at the constituency level instead of 
focusing on specific sectors or themes. So my question to you is, why did the South Asia Re Regional Hub choose to do this? And why did you think it was important to adopt this approach? Over to you, Selene. Thanks, Abhi. Let me start with a quote from the Nepal team. And they were very clear. They said, you know, we get a lot of acknowledgement internationally and globally and at all your forums. We want that acknowledgement locally. We want to build the same relationships of trust locally. And that is the message, right, of the local and why the local is so important. And so while we, we have created this global platform, the South Asia Resilience Hub decided that we will use this global platform to actually begin to strengthen those local relationships and local dialogue. We've just scratched the surface of the iceberg and we see this as a long journey, you know, for the next 10 years, 15 years, we don't know if the Resilience Hub has the capacity to take on this kind of uh, agenda, but we are here to promote that agenda and whoever is ready to run with us, we are ready to run with them. So one of the things that came out very clearly was that we need to build capacities of local constituencies from particular geographies to actually talk about what they are doing locally. And this doesn't mean, so, so there's the tension between, oh, too simplistic, just one NGO, or are, is it really, you know, ident you're, are you identifying with a big political constituency? And so this tension is there and people on the front lines know what it is to be able to use one NGO to broadcast and amplify, which, for example, what's happening with many indigenous communities. So this resilience hub actually sought to do that. We got indig indigenous communities from the mangrove geographies, from mountain geographies, and from forest geographies. So interesting things have come up. And what I will do now is quickly, instead of putting my words in their mouths, I'll talk about the key messages that each of these groups, we just had 10 sessions and very briefly, the Pakistan group, for example, very clear message. They said the communities across Pakistan have in initiated their own rehabilitation process during the floods. Women, men, children are all busy repairing and rebuilding their homes. The people process is quick, easy, cost-effective, people-friendly and sustain sustainable. And we want government and we want our local partners and global partners to understand that and support that. Very clear, simple, right? The Janeda city in Bangladesh, which is a secondary city, very small city, on the other side of the spectrum, they are not dealing all the time like the mangrove communities with storms and floods, but they are building their resilience because they slowly see that the ju their jute farms are drying, their fields are drying, they are trying to, you know, to to manage what is already happening. And their main message was co-creation. So citizens groups like teachers groups, children's children, the children in Geneva have actually uh, grown about 140 gardens in their city. This is so empowering for the kids and it's so empowering for the adults and the city to, to work in a non-threatening environment where we keep pointing fingers and saying, you're wrong, you have to change your mistake, to say, let's do this together, let's co-create our city together. Great and very powerful example for many cities in Bangladesh. The Cox Bazaar example is a coastal mangrove community. One of their biggest problems was land grabbing. And this is a real issue. Now to deal with an issue like land grab, you can, you can keep talking about climate mitigation and adaptation till you know, the cows come home, but if, you're, if you don't have a strong organization locally to be able to address and engage and be fearless about managing these complexities, you're not going to be able to even touch anything on climate. So, th so these are real issues, right? And organizations of the poor or organizations of these constituencies is the only way you can respond to this, not even middle agents like me. And unfortunately, that is something that I want to unpack today at the South Asia Resilience of the role of middle agents like us and the role of community leaders and the voices on the ground who, that we want to promote. And we need to differentiate between these two. Then you talk about the Thangai community in Modpur, once again, completely devastated because you have the rubber plantations and you have people from the outside coming and cutting off the old indigenous trees, growing up new trees. So they talk about the shal forest being completely cut down. 800 rubber plantations were established by evicting tribals. 
Over 1,000 acres of forced indigenous people had to relocate because the Bangladesh Air Force built its uh, built around this property. So these are human relationships. These are human reasons why people have to move. And I think one needs to therefore be very careful what we say is climate driven and what we say is man-made driven and what we are creating in our context. Then we're talking about the far mountain region in Nepal. I started with them where they said, we, we don't want, means we're happy to have the international community acknowledge and support us, but we really want to be able to change our relationships locally. They said there was no, uh, no data. They have 200 snow peaks in that region. They had no data documenting that, understanding which communities are on these snow peaks. They said, we want a, a better surveillance. We need better information so that we can manage this better. The women farmers from Maharashtra already have, they're running with their local government. They've been able to get them on board. They are able to create new production systems to create organic farming methodologies. And they want more support to scale and grow. And this was their message. And then we had a very interesting uh, session on using photo voice and uh, di digital di uh, diaries and stories to be able doc to document stories of communities during the COVID times, both in the Sundarbans in Bangladesh and in India, and the power of using the photo stories with these indigenous, with these local communities to be able to discuss issues that were important to them. So one of the questions I asked them was, could you use the photo technology to actually take pictures when land is being grabbed by the more powerful in your city. So they had not even thought about that, but this is the way we can you know, strengthen each other by listening to each other's stories and strengthening our constituencies so that we can be able to navigate not only our local, but other geographies gradually and slowly. And we don't expect that magic to happen overnight. And we hope the Resilience Hub will be able to do a better job and take this process deeper. Thank you. Thanks so much, Celine. I think fantastic to hear, you know, after having seen many of your events and having attended several of them, some of the key messages that I know you've worked very closely with these different constituencies in, in pulling together. Uh, this might actually be a good opportunity, Marcia, to turn a question to you, uh, given uh, what Celine has just mentioned. The high-level champions in many different interventions that they've given over the last two years that I've heard at least, have really emphasized the importance of engaging local voices, empowering communities and grassroots organizations, and having their voices be amplified through various different channels. And I think they, in many instances, have played a role in this themselves. Perhaps you could describe some of the ways um, some of these messages are planned to be amplified at COP27. There's a lot going on and it can certainly be a bit overwhelming with COP27, but Marcia, I know you have such a great overview of, of so many of the different adaptation and resilience spaces at COP, both for high level champions and race to resilience, but also more broadly. So let me just turn this question back over to you from what Celine has just said. How are some of these messages going to be amplified at COP27? Thank you very much. <clears throat> An excellent example, Celine, that really helped explain the urgency to have clear messaging coming from local actors. And this year, we've put an emphasis to make sure we give the space, and especially through the previous engagements on the regional climate action weeks and the virtual hubs, to better bring those stories, those contexts, those challenges. As you very much reflected, advancing the climate agenda and especially delivering an adaptation of resilience um, is very interconnected. It's, we required a system approach, but as well, we required those key examples and solutions that need to be customized. So the Race to Resilience have a very strong um, emphasis on promoting locally led adaptation principles. We require these two partners joining the campaign, but at the same time, we wanna foster the dialogue, how this gets operationalized, what are opportunities to better access vulnerable communities to solve solutions, to co-create, to uh, understand the perspective that they actually need, and at the same time promote 
um, how access to finance and what is the role of non-state actors to actually help accelerate action and do not depend necessarily on state-driven processes um, in a way that can, of course, support the ambition group. But in, in practical terms, what we've heard uh, from all of these different interventions and, and, and engagements with regional focus is we, we want to make sure that we are supportive of that locally led efforts that avoid maladaptation or very conscious of not ex ex exporting solutions that are not suitable to the context, either because of environment, nature-based solutions approaches, or because of governance, policy, and even cultural setups. To be respectful of the context is critical. And if we want to accelerate action, we also have heard we need to make sure we are elevating those solutions and those um, perspectives. We want to make sure that we are proving that these are happening and, and we're not pretending we're starting from zero. This is a process that is a continuum, also understanding that that continuum is critical, but where it fits, it's, it's, it's in a context that we are also have to understand sustainable development, how we approach in a resilient sustainable development pathway and how do we connect and allow and trickle down those opportunities to local communities. <clears throat> so the evolving of decision-making, the evolving of finance is critical, but at the same time, uh, making sure that we are understanding what is the context of climate justice here, a just, diverse and equitable opportunities to deliver resilience and very much understanding the intergenerational context of climate change, but at the same time, that the most affected um, are the ones that are even having more impact through through climate change because of the vulnerabilities that they that they show and they have. But um, what we're doing in this year is, first of all, recognizing this context, elevating and positioning through those different venues um, across the year through the climate weeks to the virtual hubs, but it is especially at the hub, um, I'm sorry, at the COP27, we understand adaptation and resilience. It's a major priority of COP27 presidency and making sure we understand how we can frame it, support the initiatives that COP27 is going to bring to, to be critical in that time of elevating an agenda of adaptation and resilience that is supportive of local actors, supportive of a just transition, and also supportive of that broader system transformation needed um, towards um, sustainable development at the end of the day. Knows how we are better understanding, continue to build forward, um, but on the, at the same time, elevated an, an agenda that is critical on implementation and solutions and the voices of the actors that are already implementing those efforts. But at the same time, what is needed? How we accelerate finance? How do we shape further governance and policy systems so that it can further accelerate the impact and the ambition group? Thanks, Basie. And very quickly, because I know you have to leave at the top of the hour, but we'll continue the, the panel for a little bit after that. If people want to engage with the Race to Resilience or High Level Champions, how do they do so? Particularly if they are coming from from working on the ground and with communities. Yes, we are very open and seek for any actors that would like to share their thoughts, ideas, successful and challenging stories. Uh, so please do reach out either through the website. We can send the website link, my email link, and uh, the uh, Race to Resilience campaign manager Juanita Silva contact as well. So you can have access to information about how you can elevate your context information or, or any uh, additional sharing and, and exposing to other actors that are as well driving this agenda. It is critical for us as well to understand that we will be able to have a strong and stable advancement on delivering adaptation and resilience if we're also exchanging and learning from what it works, what doesn't work, and how we're better connecting those political windows that can be opened through the COP processes to elevate an agenda and position, again, long-term um, implementation. So happy, very, very much happy uh, if we can send our contacts um, so to continue this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marcia. And I know you have to jump in a minute. Uh, so let me thank you now for joining us uh, and certainly looking forward to engaging with you further in the drumbeat to COP27. Um, 
Moving, moving on to the Africa Regional Resilience Hub, uh, Shinaz, I always enjoy hearing your reflections, particularly in your closing remarks uh, for the events that took place two weeks ago. Very briefly, what did the Africa uh, Resilience Hub, or sorry, rather, Regional Hub focus on, and what's something that stood out for you, something that perhaps was quite unexpected? Yeah. Um, thank you, Amil, and thank you for this opportunity. So if I could just, I think it's important that when we're trying to be climate just and bring across a justice lens to be inclusive, that everything we do ties in with that. So with that, I'd just like to talk through how we um, approach the resilience hub and then something that really stood out for me. So what we did as the Africa hub was to have an open call through an expression of interest as we wanted to be as open and inclusive as possible. Our criteria was that it had to be led by an African organization. It at least had to have 50% of spe or women speakers and at least 50% had to be African. And we were really ruthless about that in terms of um, event sessions. We also wanted to give Africans an opportunity to talk about what was important to them and showcase their solutions as well as bring up challenges. So what we decided to do was use a thematic approach so we could link and align it better with the Resilience Hub. So we did not choose all of the Resilience Hub, but a selection of five, which was finance and investment. Let me just say that we thought these five were really pertinent for the Africa continent. Food and agriculture, resilient infrastructure, water and natural ecosystems, and then cities and urbanization. We prioritize the cross-cutting themes, which were gender and social inclusion. And uh, very important for us was around amplifying local voices. For me, what was something that really stood out as a surprise, but also that there was huge potential is that uh, what came across in the session on, I think it was the startups, is that in African countries, your SMEs make up more than 90% of all enterprises. I thought this was quite, um, quite an eye opener for me. Sub-Saharan Africa alone has 44 million micro, small, and medium enterprises, and SMEs are responsible for an estimated 80% of jobs across the continent. So the startup environment in Africa is vibrant and can play a really critical and important role in making people more resilient. And what often happens is when we talk about resilience in Africa, it's about who are the donors we approach, who can we, whereas actually the solution seems to me to be lying in Africa and it's there for the harvesting. So with that, Tamil, back to you. Thanks, Shinaz. And uh, I attended, I think, uh, it, at least the one session that really stood out around uh, the role of, of enterprises and startups, particularly in the tech space. Um, and it was a fantastic discussion, I think, really emphasized why these regional resilience hubs are important why them taking place before COP to give us a chance to then deliberate and digest and really think about what was spoken about so that we can take that to COP and be very clear on it. Um, uh, certainly excellent uh, to, to hear these reflections. Paz, I know that the Latin American Caribbean Regional Hub uh, kicked off last week and you still have sessions running until the 10th of October, but you also have taken a different approach uh, with the LAT Regional Hub. So perhaps over to you for uh, a very brief introduction to how you've approached it and 
perhaps you can talk us through a solution that that has maybe emerged out of your regional hub or one that perhaps Avena is aware of from your region that is important for your region, but may also be of global relevance as well. So pass over to you. Thanks, Amil. Yes, we have uh, just begun, but we uh, have already had uh, some meetings and we are so, so there are some messages that I can share with you. Um, first, I would like to let you know that something that surprised me positively was the great interest that there is in the region to work with the Resilience Hub uh, to make our uh, priorities more visible and to interact with uh, the COP and with other organizations of the Global South. So that was a joy uh, to, to learn and to see and to, and to know thanks to this process. Uh, as, as you know, when we started the process of coordinating the Latin American Resilience Hub, uh, we selected different issues that we, begin, we believe that are important for Latin America. Those are water resources, access to finance, ecosystem, messages for the global stocktake cities, and uh, the local voices, raising the local voices, such as women, indigenous people, and youth. So uh, as I hear, there are some similarities with other regions too on that. So I'm sure we will be able to, to share ideas and results uh, once we, we meet. Uh, when we decided and defined these topics, uh, the next step we took was to uh, talk and invite other organization partners to help us co-lead those workshops to discuss and do this um, messages harvesting. Um, I believe uh, Marcia mentioned uh, that um, <clears throat> we about the importance of supporting and knowing that we are not starting a process from scratch, but there's a lot of work done in the region. So that was our spirit to co-work and uh, collaborate with other organizations, since collaboration is one of the main goals of Fundación Avina. So something uh, that I would like to share are some of the messages that we are harvesting thanks to the, the workshops that we have already done uh, Last week, we had uh, the family farming um, a workshop and some of the topics that or the messages that we'd like to highlight are not only that uh, about the impacts that the region are suffering that which unfortunately are well known, such as uh, the, the loss of glaciers, the, uh, the deforestation, I could make a big list. But what I would like to, to let you know is about the importance of uh, the cosmovision of the indigenous people to that the climate change is not only impacted on the soil or on the glaciers, but in the way of living of these people of, and of, of all the region. And about the importance of knowing that uh, that way the, the, the way that these people live is uh, in, in a very showing and mutual coordination with nature. And if we lose that, then we are losing a big part of our um, DNA, I could say. <laughs> and so that's a, a, def, a, a very Latin America kind of message that we are very much in connection with the nature and especially in the rural areas. And also something that we discussed was about the importance of uh, connecting with the people that consume, that eat, that buy, uh, to let them know uh, the importance of healthy uh, uh, food, of being a healthy life, and how this uh, agriculture can help us build a healthier world. And now that we have been through COVID, we are start understanding much more about the importance of health and about the importance of being in contact with nature for our mental health. So that was something that also came up about the importance, not only to uh, the, the people that are producing um, food, not only that they have to deal with the impacts, but that we have to connect with those in the cities that are the ones that con consume, that they are the ones that move, uh, with their money and the decision making what they want to buy. And something else that was very important and we are including and, and talking in the uh, 
topic of financing is the need that uh, that is very necessary that we start a, an, an advocacy process with the big uh, funding organizations to ask them and to make them understand that even though science, we all agree, is very important and uh, scientific knowledge is much is very necessary, there are other ways in which uh, people in the ground uh, understand science and understand the impact and other ways in which they understand climate change or not understand, but the way they uh, feel or see or uh, believe in climate change. And that traditional knowledge should also be uh, considered and understood as, a, as important as science. Uh, and so we are starting to build uh, a way on how to incorporate the, the local knowledge on to, to make, uh, make it um, um, reachable for, for and as important and necessary to access to finance too. Thanks, Paz. Uh, I think something I'll definitely take away from your intervention is that we're not just, you know, at physical risk of climate change, but what about our intangible human culture, our way of being, our life? What is at risk and, and how do we ensure that we are also seeing this from the perspective of those that are on the front lines of it. Um, certainly something I'm going to take away. And thank you for sharing uh, what you're doing in the LAC Regional Hub. Of course, for those of you listening, uh, the Latin American Caribbean Regional Hub events are still taking place. And we will be sharing the link to the website where you can find all of the events that took place, as well as the session recordings for South Asia and Africa as well. Before we jump into the breakouts. Uh, I am running a bit over time with this panel, but I do want to take this opportunity to uh, ask Celine, for you, what was something that was really unexpected with this regional resilience hubs process, having gone through it for the last couple of months? So not just the discussions that took place, but also the process in getting there. So two things, Amil. One is, um... While I'm a great believer of strengthening the capacities of local organizations, what I saw coming out was that the walls in the front of them are so huge, like even it overwhelmed me, right? So if you have a rubber factory coming and putting poison in your river water and you have to run away and flee, what do you tell that community to do? What is your adaptation strategy, right? So. So while it looks simple and there were these very difficult issues coming up of local groups feeling quite helpless and very fearful of how to manage this. And I feel the only way we can strengthen their hands is by supporting them to organize locally and to be together because when they are not organized, 40 families just fled and ran away because of that poison water, right? Another thousand families fled from Nepal and ran away when they had a big devastation of a typhoon or whatever. So this is happening and it is, can we stop it? Can we, you know, so I don't know. So I feel the science is important. The technology is important. All these new ideas of, you know, creating new projects is important. But if the people are not feeling empowered and you don't build their capacity, so can we invest in that process? We have to invest in that process. Thanks, Lean. I think that's a great reflection. And, you know, last sort of quick thoughts from Shinaz and Paz. Shinaz, looking at COP27, for you, what would a successful COP27 look like from the perspective of amplifying the voices of local adapters? Yeah. So, so Amil, thank you for that question. And it's quite a complex, like a systems type question. But I think for me, one thing, if we can walk away from that COP with confidence that financing for local action will be patient and sustainable i think that will be a big win so that so that and not dependent on the politics of the country so i yeah so for me that will be a huge win that's a that's a great reflection and uh patient predictable financing one of the lla principles so 
Uh, certainly lots of integration there with the discussions that will be taking place at CBA. And Paz, same question for you. What, what does a successful COP27 look like, particularly from the perspective of local adapters and local voices, but also just more broadly? Thanks, Amir. Well, I, I totally need to support with, uh, Shanice has already said, uh, finance is our main goal and hope and especially finance that arrives to concrete tangible solutions um, really making the changes that are needed. Uh, but I think that another thing I will um, be, I would love to, to see strengthen are the links and the relations between the voices of the Global South. Uh, we're working hard with colleagues from other regions thanks to, to this opportunity that the Resilience Hub brings us, but also with our Alliance Voices for Climate Action and Impro South. But I think we still, there's a still a lot to do uh, so that we can join forces. Um, I will also see, I would also like to see that the local voices are given the recognition and space that is needed, that their voices are heard. Thanks so much, Paz. And, and with that, I'm going to end this panel discussion. And the portion of this session where you're hearing from us will officially be over. And we transition into hearing from all of you. I wanted to emphasize what each of the regional hubs were doing uh, to inspire you and help everyone understand why it is we are doing this. So that when we go into these breakout groups uh, for Africa and South Asia specifically, we won't be having a LAC breakout group uh, simply because they're still running their events. And also LAC participation at CBA is, is typically quite low given the time zone difference and the time of this event wasn't appropriate to try have a breakout for LAC. Um, when we go into these breakouts, that'll be facilitated by CDK and for Africa and ICAD for South Asia, you will get a chance to contribute using a mirror board. Uh, you'll be given some more instructions uh, once you go into the breakout group. Um, uh, Amy, if you could make the breakout groups visible now to everyone, that would be great. So you have the opportunity to select which discussion you would like to be a part of. We're going to have about 25 minutes to close to 30 minutes for you to actually start inputting in. So we've done months and months of work on these regional resilience hubs to try and understand what key messages, solutions, regional priorities, particularly from the perspective of communities, grassroots organizations, and lesser heard and underrepresented constituencies. What are their messages and what do we want to take to COP27? And now it's your opportunity to input into that process. So without further ado, you have your breakout rooms that are visible to you. There should be two breakout rooms, one for South Asia, one for Africa. Join the one that you can contribute to. If your region that you work in is not represented there, that's totally fine. Join one of the other ones and share your reflections on the discussion happening about that region and the key messages. I'm absolutely confident that you will have something to say. So please do join and we'll see you back here in about 25 minutes or so. Thank you. Just to add, if anybody can't see the invitation to join the breakout room, then you can click on breakout rooms on your toolbar and you should see something there. If you don't, um, stay in plenary and I will help you get to a room. If anybody that is currently still here um, is having problems getting to a breakout room, please just pop in the chat which room you'd like to go to and I can send you there.
for anyone that is still here, if you're having trouble getting into a breakout room, uh, please send me a message and I'll help you get into a room.
Hi, everyone. Let's just give a moment for everyone to join back in. Great. I hope you all enjoyed the opportunity to have a bit more of a focused discussion based on a particular region. I think it's very much in the ethos of the regional resilience hubs to create these spaces. Uh, of course, uh, much of what was maybe presented came from you know, several weeks and months of engagement, uh, but the CBA community, of course, has so much to add to this. So just to say that the mirror boards will be live for the rest of CBA 16. So if you, know, you didn't get a chance to add in some thoughts or uh, you think of something after the session ends, please do jump back on that mirror board. Uh, and add it in there. As we've mentioned, the regional resilience hubs are working on these regionally contextualized solutions, key messages, priorities, et cetera, um, and how we wanna take this to COP27 uh, through the COP27 resilience hub, with that being the home of the race to resilience as well, and all of the other platforms and connections that that then gives us access to. So uh, we wanna keep the report back very brief, uh, just because, you will hear from this through the resilience hub itself. That's still to happen. And all of this will be a part of that, including the regional hubs having a strong presence on the resilience hub virtual platform. We'll give you information on how to register for that and where to find it. But very briefly, before we jump into a last Mentimeter and then to close, um, perhaps we can hear back first from the Africa regional hub. So Lucia, uh, will you be giving us just two minutes a uh, brief summary of what you spoke about. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mila. So um, we had uh, we decided to dive deep into three statements that uh, came out quite strongly from uh, from the Africa Hub. One of them is that uh, climate resilience provides a business opportunity. Um, so we wanted to hear whether the statement was uh, correct, uh, what examples we have, what we agreed with or didn't agree with. We also talked about, uh, or rather got input about uh, uh, investing in people rather than infrastructure, as uh, this is the strongest entry point for systemic change. So again, people had the opportunity to input on the statement and uh, and how it can be brought into to reality if uh, if in agreement. And the last one was uh, about. Um, uh, cities uh, needing to really leave uh, the planning of their settlements uh, into the hands of uh, community-based planners uh, and then focusing more on uh, which parts of the city should be settled and which not, uh, but uh, really like empowering the, uh, the local organizations and people to plan their settlements. So that is what we talked about. I think uh, it will be very tricky to summarize as uh, there were there was a lot of input and we had a, a nice chat, unfortunately, with the, as usual, not enough time. But uh, I think they, with the link to the mirror board, everybody can take a look and uh, we'll, uh, we'll also look at it in more detail, but thanks. Thanks so much, Lucia. Uh, can we get a representative from the South Asia discussion just to give us a two minute uh, feedback on what you discussed? Vilina, are you doing that? Hello. Vilina, I... Vilina, are you able to unmute yourself and give us just a two minute quick update? Okay, I'll try to do that. So basically people were uh, reacting to this from their own context. We had a scientist in our group. We had a student from LSE from Pakistan. We had uh, young activists from, uh, from uh, Bhutan. We had a Kundu from Nairobi and we had a doctor from Pakistan. And all of them you know, completely uh, endorsed the idea that communities are not waiting for outsiders. They are already starting and these are difficult governance issues that need to be tackled and we need support to be able to do this, not just uh, at a local level, but to slowly build these local networks to engage with regional networks because our geographies in some way also connect. So how do we do both? And that was the main message that came out from my group. I would like any of our group members to add if I have missed out anything 
Selena, so when focus that I had one issue to be added to the end uh, because of paucity of time that could not be added. I'm just saying that now uh, there is something like uh, the best practices for climate resilience. You know, we have the community resilience. Say, for example, Indian case you take, whether it is tsunami or um, you have uh, cyclones and also the pandemic. These three, if you take, when you look at the issue of governance, see what is happening in a subtle way. The Indian society, the court gives the way. The constitution is so strong, it will not allow the community to lose the battle. To me, it's very important. You must capture the best practices of community resilience so that it goes as a good signal for places like Pakistan, Kenya, and so many countries where the constitution, where the political order is not stabilized. At least I can tell you with my experience, Indian system has got some unique things of the court of law. Mr. Jagannathan, sorry, we will have to end the session soon. So I would like to hand it over to Amir to round it up. But we got your point. We, we got your point. point. Yeah. Yeah. I can read the point, best practices documentation yeah. sure. to live through the hindrances for governance will be the way out. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that last point. And, and feel free to add that to the mirror board, of course. Uh, that's your chance to write things in as much detail as you'd like, of course. When there's always time constraints, we're always pressured to have to be very succinct and summarize. But sometimes that's not always enough to capture the nuance. Uh, Paz is still with us. And Paz, I know that Avina is helping to launch uh, a really great solution for getting resources to the ground and for financing locally led adaptation. So I wanted to give you, given that there wasn't a Latin American Caribbean breakout group, just a minute or two, just to share one of the solutions that's emerged out of the LAC regional hub. So over to you, Paz. Thanks, Amir. And I will try not to steal much time, but I think it will be, uh, I would like to share this news with all of you because it's not only regarding Latin America, but with the global South in general. Um, as we all know about the, this problem accessing to finance, Avina is launching uh, an initiative that we call BASE. Um, we will be launching it at COP27 and this initiative seeks three objectives. The first one is to identify new ways to demonstrate climate rationality, incorporating traditional knowledge. Uh, previously, we were all talking about the importance of this topic and how sometimes uh, it can be a barrier to demonstrate the climate rationality. So that's one point. The second goal is to advocate for large, large funds to be more agile and effective. Uh, so that uh, the, the money really gets to those that need it to implement real tangible actions. And the first and maybe the most important is that at COP27, we will be launching our first round of funding, which will open early 2023. And it will be an opportunity for local communities to access to real money to, for real solutions. So I would like to share my email with all of you uh, to send you more information if it is of interest and the invitation to this lunch at COP27. Thanks. Thanks so much, Paz. Um, so we've got a few minutes left and uh, uh, Emma, you can share the Mentimeter instructions. Many of you will have used Mentimeter before, uh, but just some brief instructions. Grab your phone or laptop, go to menti.com. Um, and then enter the code when it's requested. The code is 5573306. So we'll just leave this up on the screen for a moment so you can all jump onto Mentimeter. The Mentimeter questions that have been added here, for me at least in terms of what we want to get from you is we're using this word amplify a lot and we're using the context of local voices, local adapters, communities a lot. We're hearing it in so many different fora. And I think to be true to the intention of doing that, it's about really unpacking and understanding what does it mean to amplify so that that term doesn't become an empty term uh, and that we don't quote unquote start local washing 
where we start using the right words uh, without keeping the intention and the vision of why we're using those words at the heart of the action we're taking. So before we jump into the last two questions, as a way to just kind of end off this discussion, which has been largely about process, about what it is that we have done thus far, and what the rest of the drumbeat up to COP27 will look like with, the, with what intentions we want to take there. So um, Emma, perhaps you can stop sharing your screen. I hope everyone's had a chance to grab that code. It'll load to be up on the Mentimeter itself. Uh, so Emma, if you can stop sharing your screen and Zizi, if you can share your screen with the actual Mentimeter itself. Uh, there we go. All right, fantastic. So the first question is, how can lesser heard voices better be given the recognition they deserve at COP27? And so, of course, the regional resilience hubs is a process that we have iterated this year. It's different from last year. Uh, the intention this year, of course, was to be able to give more time to really digest and absorb the rich regional discussions that were taking place. It's not a perfect process. And so we really do want to learn iteratively and get better at this over time, as I said, so that we can be true to the intention of what we mean when we say we want to amplify these local adapters voices at spaces like COP27. So give us your thoughts. I mean, share your thoughts on if you think this can be better. Uh, this is a question that pertain specifically to COP27, and uh, we'll jump to the next question in a moment. But let me take a second to read some of these uh, and perhaps share some of them uh, with all of you. Yeah, excellent point there on visas, accommodation, and accreditation for passes particularly for spaces like COP27. If you're not familiar with those processes, it can be incredibly limiting for organizations to access the blue zone pass, the pass that gets you into kind of the exhibition space where so much of this discussion takes place. And one of the key things that we focused on with the Resilience Hub is actually making this hybrid. So there's an entire uh, Resilience Hub platform that is now live for you to register for. And just before we close, we'll drop that link in so you can register. And part of what we want to do there is to be able to bring a global audience into these spaces. Fantastic. I see lots of answers here. Translation, massive one as well. Always a difficult one, but something that I think most of us agree is crucial for increasing the accessibility of these voices in these spaces, being able to let them speak in their own language. All right, so I'm not going to read too many more. There is one more question, and we have just two minutes left. So Zizi, could you go to the next question? So this particular question is, how do we amplify these voices beyond events like COP27? So let's just give a moment for everyone to throw in some thoughts. See some great ideas coming through. Radio-based shows, absolutely. We know that for many communities, particularly in rural areas, radio is a fantastic technology to reach them. Of course, this will be contextual and differ for different circumstances, but great to see some ideas like this coming through. All right, continue to add your thoughts here. This will all be taken into consideration, both for uh, how we build up to COP27 now, but also how we shape these regional resilience hubs moving forward. It's something that's intended to take place every year at every COP. Um, and so your thoughts on this is incredibly important for us, particularly in the context of a conference like CBA. So I wanted to end off this session. We've pretty much run out of time.
by directing you to the Resilience Hub website, uh, which will be shared in the chat now. Uh, you can go into that website, you can uh, register for the Resilience Hub virtual platform. On that platform, you will get full access to all of the Blue Zone events under the Resilience Hub, which will all be hybrid. Um, they're designed to be engaging, participatory. We're really trying to draw in just a huge range of different voices and stakeholders to contribute into that space. Um, and you can also find the sub pages for all of the regional resilience hubs and under there you'll be able to access all their session recordings uh, all of their priorities their themes you can get in touch with them directly if you have further contributions to make um, so please encourage you to go into their website there's so much that's going to be happening at cop 27 we really invite and welcome all of you to engage with the resilience hub as well so on that note, I'm one minute over, so I'm going to officially end this session, but certainly not ending this discussion. Thank you, everyone, uh, and thank you to our panelists and facilitators of our sessions. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Emil. Bye.